I've always believed in, in chance, you know, and the things that happen in people's lives. And, and it's not, looking back, at you can say meant to be, but at the time, <laughs> you didn't say that at all. I think, I think it helped a lot that I grew up among people who were making their own implements, where people made a lot of the things that they needed. So I've, I've always used my hands, and then one thing led to another. I, I was interested in boats, and I, um, you know, I had a couple of comrades that lived on the beach near where I did, and we built boats together, small sailboats, and sailed. So ships, you know, are a part of my life, and sailing, and boats, and so on. And from then on, it was just pure chance. People were saying that if you go to, um, to Sweden, you can get work. So I thought, well, you know, I'll work and I'll travel. And just by chance, I um, stopped by Momsten's store. I walked in and it still looked good. And uh, I found out that Momsten also had a school for cabinet making. I went up there and I just finally talked my way in. Spent three years there. And I and Ryman, who were older than most of the students, managed to preserve our own direction and identity. Because if you come to Malmsten, or came, he's gone now, but if you came to Malmsten as, as very young, you were molded. And you came out of there as a little secondary Malmsten. Uh, I didn't come out there as a glowing individual, but I at least kept something of myself, you know. But I'm happy to admit that I definitely was inf influenced by Carl. I mean, the language of that school I have kept. I've never abandoned for anything else. Uh, the language, but not, not the, you know, what you write. In other words, what you write is your book, but <laughs> the language is mom's then. The soft edges, the gentle curves, the attention to the wood, you know, the surfaces, the edges, all these things. Uh, the uh, use of furniture being a beginning point. But he was also very aesthetically conscious. I mean, he had a fine eye for lines. And I got that from boats too. So, you know, his eye and my eye together. And, and it, it was a good, edu good education. There is an element of discovery in almost any process in, 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 in cabinet making, a sharpening a tool. You discover how easy it is if you just, you know, do certain things with your hands and your eye and you listen to what you're doing, you listen to the wheel and you, you realize that it's more simple than you imagined. And that's a little discovery. I think that that is the thing that you become aware of your increasing skills or sensitivities or something like that. And those are, uh, are nourishing in a way. You, you don't get that standstill feeling, which probably leads some people to turn to mechanical aids and try to get some of the gadgetry that is available to compensate for their lack of sensitivity. So I think, you know, that if you approach the wood and the tools and your little sketches and everything sensitively, you'll discover that there are these things that, that happen that, that uh, surprise you and please you. It's just a very quiet sense of um, doing something well, that it moves along and that uh, you're not um, abandoning some of your uh, levels that you want to work to. You know, you start planning the work in your mind and, and, and evolve these sequences and things. And then along the way, uh, there are all these little discoveries, you know, in, in, in the wood, in the tools, and in, in the way that you um, feel that particular day. I mean, there are, there are ways of doing things that are very tiring but you'll, you will have 
you know, travel the trail enough times to start recognizing the flowers are along the way and not just looking at the map and, and, and where you're going. I'm not saying that it's thrilling, but it is a little spice in your existence because you are enthusiastic about what you're doing. We learn gradually through the processes. We learn to simplify, to rationalize, to, to make everything less work and not more work. We're pressured by ourselves, not by other people, but by ourselves. And the more you pressure yourself, uh, the more chances there are really that you will fumble and uh, stumble and, you know, things will happen and, and, and work won't come smoothly and naturally to you. So what you gradually learn is your strong sides and your weak sides, um, how easily it comes to you to organize your work, uh, uh, how you feel about being interrupted. Um, but mostly, um, it just includes everything, you know. You can, you can discover a great deal about how to sharpen by just observing yourself doing it and noticing how your body and your eyes and your hands work. And, and suddenly you notice that it comes easily. And then you try to record that, you know, try to register that somehow, that if I relax, I'm going to be a lot better off than if I tense myself to hold this iron without, without shifting it an iota, you know, I'm, I'm emulating a machine. But if you just relax and let your body work and the thing, it comes much more naturally. Long ago, I discovered that if you're going to keep at it steadily, that it's good to work out your own rhythm in the sense that if you've done something very exacting and, and methodical and intricate, that the next thing you want to do maybe is very physical and simple, where you're just making shavings and, and simple fittings, you know, just that kind of thing. Because of the way I work, uh, I'm never sure how what I'm doing is going to turn out. And I think that's always been crucial, you know, very important, that element of how will it be. Everything has been improvised up to a certain point, you know, it just happens by chance. Just looking back and realizing uh, that although I didn't flip a coin, that, that you know, a part of it was semi-accidental, that I didn't do it knowing that it would be better. I was hoping that it would be better. And that's where that little element of chance comes in, which is, to me, you know, that almost central in the work. I try to start with um, the things that I feel are most crucial. You know, sometimes it will be well, let's say, if it's a table, then if the tabletop is not beautiful, there's no sense in making the table um, a coopered cabinet. If the doors are not lovely and or attractive or have something special to say, then the rest of the cabinet is, you know, dependent on that, and it's not going to be a success. So I think I tend to try to cent center on what I think is a make or break for that particular piece. And then if I get this little impulse, this idea, then of course it immediately leads me to a choice of wood, which, you know, is inevitable for most of us. And that's exciting. And if I'm lucky and find something that I think goes well with the idea that I have at that particular time, then um, the rest is, uh, you know, clearing up the concept. That uh, time-worn, I love wood, uh, 
phrase and somebody thinking that I put on a white robe and, and slippers and sit cross-legged and, and stare at the plank for three days is it, 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 really not at all what it's about, you know. Um, somewhat excites me, just as it does anybody in this room. I mean, we walk up to something that's absolutely fabulous and it turns us on. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a real thing. I think the emotional excitement helps me, yeah. But it's not you know, a frenzy and it's not deep meditative process. It's just an awareness that many people share. God, anybody that takes any kind of work very, fairly seriously, especially if it's uh, creative work, uh, they get emotionally involved. Without that, where does the energy come from? You know, if you work well and, and consistently and, and so on, the, um, the intensity, the emotional intensity, the, the, uh, the eye strain, the, the physical aspects of it and everything can be very tiring, especially the, the mental part. Fundamentally, you know, it's your hand, it's your eye, and it's this tool. And when it feels comfortable, you'll do good work. And if, when it feels awkward, you're, you're, a part of your energy and your concentration is in the wrong place. It's trying to find out what's wrong with the tool. The basis of caring for tools is the intimacy of the process that you are using them in. You know, a plane is, is sort of one of the most essential tools in cabinet making. Uh, and it can be just a tool and it can be a fine instrument. I've had more or less the same tools for 40 years. You know, give or take, I've given away a lot and made maybe some, you know, some new planes now and then or something of that sort. But basically, um, the cabinet maker's tools as we look at them, haven't changed since the Barnsleys and before the Barnsleys and the Stickleys and all the others. Okay. The custom wood no. green. Okay. We use plane making as a way of finding out a little bit about wood from the beginning, you know, what happens when you saw up the parts and sometimes they warp a little bit or pull or something and we call attention to that. That brings us even closer to the nature of wood, you know, what it does and doesn't do and the difference between different woods. So I think it's, you know, it, it, it suits us. Uh, it's good for us, but we wouldn't perish without it. Although I don't, I, I, maybe that's an exaggeration because really we, we do wonderful things with surfaces and, and edges and uh, so on with fine cutting tools. We do. And um, it shows, you know, of a crest rail of a chair with the grain beautifully following the shape of the crest rail, that that's not accidental. You don't do that with your eyes closed. You select a piece of wood and you know how you're going to cut it to get that particular rhythm. But that's just within the boundaries, you know, within the things that come naturally to us the shapes, the, the, the objects. You know, we have a common language, and within that we have all these dialects and all these uh, different interpretations and things, but we don't uh, go overboard in the sense that we lose some of the essentials that make this thing work as it does, because we can't pretend to be all things to all people. People know that within that particular parameter, uh, there's a lot of freedom, you know. The only thing that we don't necessarily encourage is for you to stand on your head and do it. Oh, no sound. If, if we keep on like we are now, there, there is a danger that we will uh, gradually forget those satisfactions and think that the, the accomplishment, the final product is where the satisfaction is, rather than in the doing, which should be as impersonal as possible, you know. 
I go the other way. The doing should be as personal as possible, as intimate as possible, and then let the part product be what it, what it will. As long as there are people who don't take kindly to having their life consist of pushing buttons and watching blinking lights and counting other people's money, there will be always people drawn to craft, and maybe more so later on if we become even more technically, you know, advanced. Somewhere along the line, you have to point out the fact that some words have worn pretty thin, like quality, uh, art, uh, w words like that. And I prefer artistic, which, you know, goes back to ethnic things and to, to very elementary um, qualities in people. The Aborigines in Australia are, most of them, uh, quite artistic. They'll make a boomerang that's a, that's a beautiful object, and yet it's functional. And, I find that, you know, artistic is a nice word. It, it's a very artistic object, or you're, you are artistic. You have qualities of sensitivity of line and shape and, and, and so on, you know, texture and shades and all the rest of it. I prefer vanity to ego. And vanity is much more natural and much less uh, demanding and assertive, you know, ego is assertive, self-assertion and, and trying to outdo somebody or something. Now we're coming to the person, the um, talent or lack of talent, the uh, intuitive sense of line and proportion that some people have and, and other people don't. I keep harping on harmony and, and trying to get people to look for balance, look for rhythm, uh, look for something that comes to rest by itself and yet that you don't neglect, you know, that, that attracts your attention because it's at rest. When I see somebody doing fascinating work, uh, I'm curious, I, I'm apt to spend more time with him or her, at least periodically, you know, just because I am enjoying what they're doing. You know, one of the things that really bothered me is to see people graduate uh, from here or anywhere, really, and, and be lost somewhere and not be able to make ends meet and have to, you know, do unpleasant work and uh, the things that happen to people that they don't deserve, you know, it really bring them down rather than keep them going. I'm not particularly optimistic. I think that because of, you know, computerized image and computerized people and uh, all the rest of it, uh, we are moving away from sensitivities rather than towards them. And that, um, the way we do things, uh, the thoroughness, the attention, the detail and everything will be more of a curiosity than a, than a proper thing to do. Well, the thing is that neither the Barnsleys nor Malmsten nor Stickley nor a lot of other people, including ourselves, will ever be outdated because there is no date to this. There is no date, so there's nothing to outdate. So maybe there will be a small-scale backlash against all the junk and the cheesecake. Uh, technical efficiency, you know, more production, more marketing, and the marketing is certainly not our kind of marketing. Um, the emphasis is entirely on other things than, than than come naturally to us. I always think of the, the painters who do, who have all their life have painted one theme. You know, the musicians whose music all the way through has been more or less, less recognizable. I mean, they haven't gone so far afield that you can't recognize them. 
uh, Mozart was Mozart throughout his life and so on. I mean, Brahms and Beethoven and so on. You walk into a room and something is playing and you, you may not recognize the piece, but you recognize the voice. So I stick to what I can do well, and that's my limitation. There are days when all of you can see that I'm not, you know, all sunshine. And what it is that's bothering me, sometimes I don't even know myself. Maybe I'm just, you know, physically and mentally tired and feeling my age. But um, I try not to let it rub off. But of course, in an environment like this, it probably does to an extent. You, you can get very intense towards the end, I think. Uh, just in, in, in the knowledge that your time and abilities are, are limited or will be limited soon.